All right, thank you for the introduction. All right, so we start with the slogan of enabling the Internet of Things. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. So I think everybody here has something in mind when we're talking about the Internet of Things. Um, so I'll go through that very quickly because, you know, uh, if you're here, you should know. But I think for us, it's, it's still useful to kind of understand how we look at it. Uh, and, and we think it always has to do with making things smarter, right? Whether it's a smart watch, smart building, smart city, you name it. Um, and I think that sort of shows the problem uh, when you dive a little bit deeper into that. So if I want to be smart, then I think that for, for a smart home or a smart city to be smart, it's really the same process as it would be for a human being. So if I want to be smart, I first need data coming in, right? I'm feeling, hearing, smelling, seeing things. That data goes to my brain. And, and I try to make sense of it. And when I do that, after that, I act. My hands move, my mouth move, and hopefully I say something smart. So I think for a smart city, that's exactly the same thing. Right? There's these sensing devices that are generating data. Algorithms in the cloud try to make sense of that data. And then traffic lights turn from red to green. Air conditioning uh, goes on or off. Uh, there's physical actuators. And it's, it's that simple. It's the process of making something smart. It's also exactly what creates the problem, I think. So what, what I do uh, after a long day of feeling things, I go back home and I feel tired, right? And I go to bed and I wake up the next day feeling recharged. Uh, and th this is precisely what the Internet of Things cannot do. When the Internet of Things gets tired, it dies. And I don't need to go there and change a battery or I need to wire a cable and it no longer functions. So having all of those billions of distributed sensors, instead of having them very neatly centralized on my body, I now have them spread out over this enormous area. Um, so how are we going to power them, right? It becomes the obvious problem. Well, it's either batteries have a few big problems. The batteries themselves are not very expensive, but se sending somebody there to swap out 20,000 batteries is very expensive, if even possible, because in many cases they're in locations where it's not even feasible to actually do maintenance. Or you could try to wire them. Again, very impractical, or if I'm an end user, at least it's very unpleasant to have to charge my device frequently. Right? So that's, as, there's a pretty fundamental problem there if you're going to launch a very high volume uh, Internet of Things solution. So at NOE, we, we started thinking, but what can we do there? Right? So we, we believe we need sort of a shift in paradigm. We need to move from the old plug and play. I get something out of the box, I plug it in, and it works. I think that's still important. Basically, what that says is things should be easy to install. Well, couldn't agree more. But for the Internet of Things, I think we have to think a few steps further. Right? Instead of just plug and play, it needs to be plug and forget. And we define forget as outlasting the application that you're using it for. Right, so if I'm going to play something, if I'm going to put a sensor in a road, it should really outlast the road. Because the alternative is really not an option. The alternative means the whole application is not going to work because the cost of maintenance and the cost of ownership of the system is going to far exceed the installation cost. So nobody's actually going to do that. You'll never get past that pilot phase. So how can we do that? So traditionally, I think what we've done, we've put energy in a, in a certain thing, and we, in a battery, for example, we bring it to a device. So we're always bringing energy to a device, right? Whether it's a cable or a battery, energy system needs energy, we bring it to it. Um, so what we need to do differently, I think, here is we have to use the energy that's already available at its location, because it's no longer feasible to keep bringing energy to our devices. So then you, you enter the domain of energy harvesting, right? So whether it's radio frequency signals, in some cases even GSM or Wi-Fi signals, uh, they have a little bit of energy in them. Maybe the light in this room right now, uh, piezo, the movements, temperature differences, maybe between my skin and the outside temperature, or a machine generating heat. There's energy all around us that we can use to power devices. So what we specifically focus on really is, is the part that comes after. So you have the harvester, and that's maybe a, a solar PV cell, for example, an RF antenna, and that generates a little bit of energy. Well, these are really readily available. Anybody can buy these. The difficult part comes after that. So if you look at energy harvesting, it's been around for a really long time. I, I would say, if anything, it's maybe the oldest idea that's being presented here today. So you literally, Nikola Tesla was doing this almost exactly 100 years ago, building this massive tower that was sending out radio waves that he was trying to harvest energy from. So it's an old idea. So then the question becomes, why, why haven't we seen really large-scale commercial applications of it? Well, we think there's a few very good reasons for that. Right? There's these historical challenges, really, that need to be solved. Um, 
So first one is very obvious, I think, is where the amount of energy that you can get from sources that are around us are, is really, really low. So I'm never going to power my mobile phone or my laptop by harvesting energy. The, the energy simply isn't there, right? But what, what has happened actually over the last few decades is that the efficiency of our devices has gone up enormously. And so the amount of energy we need to do a certain thing on an electronic device has dropped dramatically. And I don't really notice this most of the time, um, because how, what we've generally done is, you know, you grab an iPhone, for example, I still have to charge it every day, and that has been pretty, pretty consistent. Because as soon as we have a little bit of an efficiency gain, well, we tend to add features to it. So the consumption stays roughly the same. Better efficiency, more features, same consumption. So the Internet of Things is a little bit different, where the efficiency has improved enormously with low power communication networks, low power sensing, computing, much, much, much more low power. But the features have roughly stayed the same. Right? I want my device to measure temperature or humidity or say something about my location. Um, but that's generally about it. So the features have remained the same. The efficiency has gotten better. So the consumption has gone down. So that means for us is that for the first time, it's becoming feasible to actually use these little bits of energy that are around us to power them. So the first one has been kind of solved for us by just general technology development. So the other ones is what we are focusing on. So one difficult one, I think, where it begins with is that you get from, from these sources, you get a very, very low voltage, maybe as low as 40 to maybe 100 millivolts. That's a problem, right? Because I need my devices to, to maybe operate on 3.6 volts or something like that, a lot, lot higher. Um, so how do you do that? Well, what you need to do is boost that voltage up from 40 millivolts up to that higher voltage. Um, that is traditionally very, very difficult to do. We can do that with 92% efficiency starting as low as 40 millivolts. So we, we think we've checked that one off. That, that now works. Um, we can actually do that in a really wide range of circumstances. So if you have this light intensity here and you walk outside, it's maybe 10,000 times brighter. Um, the system adjusts itself to always have the highest efficiency in that process. We use a simple artificial intelligence uh, for that. But that, we're still not there because there's two other problems. Um, you need a high amount of external components normally. So easily around 8 to 15 extra external components you would need to be able to harvest energy. So what that results in is a really high form factor, right? The, the, the footprint on the PCB becomes big. And for most applications, it becomes too big. You simply wouldn't be able to fit it in a, in a watch, for example, or a very small tracking device. It's too big. So we're able to do that with about a 30 times smaller footprint. Um, so we, we're using a fundamentally different process uh, that enables us to not require all of those external components. So instead of 15 extra things putting around that chip, we require maybe one or even zero in some applications. Uh, so that changes things a lot. You're able to fit it in pretty much everything, uh, and you don't have to worry about size anymore. So if we compare that with, uh, uh, with some of the products you could get in that, I, I, I think we come out uh, pretty well. <laughs> um, so we're there, we're not really there yet, right? So that's, that's fun and interesting and all, but it's also very academic. It's in theory, we have all of these specifications that would be very useful. Uh, but I think progress comes from giving meaning to technology. So how do you give meaning? Well, I think you do it by solving actual problems, right? That's where things become valuable. Um, so that's what we've been doing from a very early stage, really, is trying to apply it to real world problems. Um, and, and by doing that, finding out sort of how we can give meaning to that technology. So an interesting example, I think, is a project we did in Amsterdam. Um, so we're installing here, and, and very relevant today, as I almost missed this presentation <laughs> because of delays. Um, but this is a temperature sensor that's being embedded in the road. Um, and the benefit of that is that, well, very simply, you know when the roads get cold. And when they get cold, they tend to get slippery and icy, right? And right now, it's very difficult to say anything meaningful about that. The, the system is really as simple as it's getting cold, maybe we should throw salt everywhere. Um, and that's not very accurate in most cases. Um, but for them, the use case has always been problematic because you could place a sensor in the road five years ago as well, but you would just have to go back and swap a battery. So nobody's going to do this if you have to close down a highway because your sensors ran out of battery power, right? That is just not an option. So it's not a case of it's a slightly better application. It's either you do it or you don't do it. It's, it's that big of a difference, I think. Similar use case for Proto in the Netherlands. This is uh, at the Delft uh, train station. Um, they have the same problem. 
climate management, very similar to a project in, in Dubai, um, where in a new office building they're installing around 20,000 sensors. Right? And these are all very simple things. I walk into a room, um, it knows I'm there, the lights go on. Right? Or the air conditioning gets optimized uh, based on flow of people through the building. But it adds up in terms of, in terms of sensors uh, and, and doing maintenance for those sensors. So again, for them, it enables them to really implement all of those features and to have it make sense. Like the business case makes sense because their cost of maintenance is, is practically zero. Uh, one we're really excited about, which is also a good example, I think, is, um, is smartwatches. So this is, this is a project we're doing with a Swiss watch manufacturer. So if you see me in a month from now, I should be having the, the watch on my wrist, then we're, then we're launching it. Um, so what this is really, it's, it's a, a hybrid watch. So it's able to do step counting, uh, maybe receive a notification from your phone, uh, accelerometer in there, all those, those type of things. Um, but that, that gives you a new problem, right? Where traditionally you would have a watch on your wrist and we just always work, now we have to ch charge it every couple of days. And I'm not used to that. So it's a very unpleasant user experience. And what they're seeing is that people don't do it. So the average Fitbit is somewhere in a drawer not being used after six months. <laughs> people simply don't do it. Um, so they need to, to have that thing, to have the same user experience as it, as it always had, but with these extra features. So what we're doing here, so you have the dial of the watch, uh, and behind there, there's this little solar panel. It's completely invisible. Um, so the dial blocks pretty much all of the light, except for about 10%. So about 10% of the light is able to go through the dial and reach that solar panel. Um, so there's a tiny amount of energy that you're getting from it, but that's exactly what we're good at. So that goes to our chip, and that then powers the rest of the system. Um, so if you look at a normal day, so, and we call this sort of the office worker use case, which is quite depressing when you start really mapping, out, mapping it out, but you're always indoors. Um, so you're in this office building, you have maybe 500 to 700 lux of lights, and that's it, right? You drive baby back home, uh, and then again, you're in a building uh, with artificial lights probably. So there's very, very little light exposure. Uh, but even with as little as that, what we found is that you can have full functionality, and the watch will never run out of power um, just in a normal office working use case. So that's, that's a huge game changer for this watch company, whereas normally you would have to charge their watch every couple of days. Uh, you no longer need to charge it. Right? So it's enabling uh, a lot of new features for them there as well. So I think we're just scratching the surface here. Uh, I mean, these were a few applications, but you can easily imagine in, uh, well, from asset tracking to industrial IoT that there's a lot of, and lot of use cases that are either become uh, economically a lot more interesting or even become possible by not needing to continuously swap batteries or wire cables everywhere. Um, and I think sort of long term what we're seeing in the industry there is that there's this um, um, slow move towards integration. Right, so where if I buy a communication chip, it, it's what the communication chip does, it's able to send a message from A to B. But what we're seeing is that they're adding a little bit of processing to it and a little bit of memory. So I don't really need an external MCU either. Right? And in some cases, maybe GNSS or some sort of location uh, positioning is already embedded in it. Um, and in some cases, there's a temperature sensor in there. So more and more is getting integrated. Um, so you have all of these different products that are essentially the same device. Like if you open it up, it's the same stuff that's in there. We just give it a different name, even though it's really the same thing. Um, and I think it's the same with energy there, where, where eventually we, we're seeing that a lot of these things are getting integrated into a single chip that's able to do all of these things. So we're, we're a team, we're based in, uh, based in Delft, um, uh, won a bunch of innovation awards. Uh, so we have six patents filed on this. Um, we're founded in 2015, so fairly, fairly new team still. And one of the reasons we are here right now is that, you know, I think at the end what we are doing is an innovation that enables other innovations. So nobody uses energy harvesting because they just want to harvest energy. They use it because they want to power something, right? So we're always powering something else. We're powering some sort of application. Um, so we're, we're walking around here all day. Do come and say hi and, and explain us your application, and, and we'll try to see if we can help with that. Thank you very much. Nice and short, as you yeah. said. And that was a good presentation. So I'm going to ask just one question, and it's going to be a bit of a trick question, especially for an engineer. How long before IoT devices go without batteries? Right. So then you get the, the classic engineer answer is, it depends. <laughs> um, 
So, well, you know, when, when we started, we were sort of from a technology point of view, the most beautiful solution is to have no batteries in a device, right? Um, but what we're finding more and more is that batteries are not necessarily the enemy. I think you want to have in a device that is plug and forget, and that depends on the application. When is something considered forget? When does it outlast the application that I'm using it for? Um, so I think in many, many cases, uh, for, for example, the smartwatch, it's about lifetime extension. Right? If they can go from a couple of days to a couple of years, that's more than enough for them. It kind of defeats the purpose to not have a battery in there. Although it's nice, you know, batteries are big components, they're heavy, they're, uh, they're bad for the environment. Uh, but I think it will really depend per application, uh, where in some cases it needs to be batteryless for the application to even be functional, in other ones it will be really about lifetime extension. But can you, can you generate, in all, in all these cases, can you generate the power when it's needed? Or do you need to have some, some, some battery to store the power you, you create for the watch, for example, yeah. for the night? Right, right. Well, yeah, exactly. In some cases, if you're doing solar, you're not har harvesting much uh, during the night. Uh, so you need some sort of storage element. doesn't necessarily have to be a battery. It could be some sort of capacitive element as well. Um, but, but I definitely think there's a lot of sort of synergies between the two, two types of powering methods, uh, where the end goal is not eliminating batteries. The end goal is to have the Internet of Things succeed. Right? And I think we probably need both for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Last applause. Simon von der Jaar. Thank you. Thanks.